Good morning, Woodlands. And welcome, uh, eighth Sunday already after Pentecost, hard to believe, but uh, we kind of are in the middle of the summer right now. So uh, thanks for being with us today. It's great to have you all. It's great to have you worshiping with us. Uh, we're going to get rolling here. I'm going to ask you to please stand, greet those around you with a handshake, hug, or kiss of peace, God's peace, and uh, we'll get started. Let us make our beginning this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. 
so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, grant us wisdom to recognize the treasures you have stored up for us in heaven, that we may never despair, but always rejoice and be thankful for the riches of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought from the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At, the time, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from the second epistle of Peter, beginning with chapter 1, beginning with the 16th verse. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to please rise now, if you are able, for the reading of God's holy gospel. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 28. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became dazzling white, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. 
Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We continue now with the uh, words of the Apostles' Creed as a confession of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time I'll call forward any of the young children that would like to come for the feeding of the lambs. Good morning, you guys. How is everybody doing today? Good. Well, I hope you guys are ready to listen. Because I actually have a lot of things to say, but hold on a second. Hold on. Hello. You know, I can't really listen right now because I'm in the middle of talking. I've got a lot of things i got to say. So hi. Okay. So, you guys, like I was saying, listening is very important, isn't it? Yes? Yeah. Oh. What? Hello. You know, I, I think I already told you. I've got so many different things that I'm trying to say that I can't listen right now. So, come on. You guys know what? That person might have had something important to tell me, right? Did I give them a chance? No. Oh, no. Okay. You know, I, I still, I have so much to say, I just can't listen right now. Okay? I'm sorry. Bye. I know, I did it again. So have you guys ever encountered that? Have you guys been talking with someone and they just don't listen? How does that feel? Kind of bad if you're the one that's trying to say things, right? Yeah, yeah, we all like to be listened to, right? So last week and today again in Woodlands, we are talking about prayer. Do you guys know what is prayer? Yeah, yeah, so prayer is between us and God, right? We can talk with him, we can tell him all the things that we are thankful for, the things that um, we hope that he will do in our lives and for the people that we love. But just like with the phone call and with you guys right now, when we are talking with God, does God have things to say to us? He actually does. God has, God has a lot of things to say to us, and he can reveal those things in prayer. So when we are praying to God and we're telling him all these different things, sometimes we just need to stop and listen, because God actually does talk to us in our prayer time. I had that before. I was in the middle of a prayer one time, and all of a sudden this Word, these words just kind of went through my mind. I didn't hear a voice like you're hearing my voice right now, but the words did not come from my mind. They were put in my mind by God. God was talking to me. And sometimes he does it more with a feeling or just talking to our hearts. So when we pray, again, we definitely tell God the things we're thankful for and we tell him what we need and how he can help us. But also when we pray, we need to stop. I will share his messages with us. So let's go ahead and pray right now. You guys can repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for listening to me. Help me stop, Help me stop. And, listen to you. and listen to you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you guys are welcome. We have some high school um, helpers who would like to do children's church with you if you guys would like to join them come take you to the back <laughs>
Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, welcome as we continue our journey on prayer. The best is yet to come next week <laughs> because that's when we're going to hear how Jesus himself taught us to pray. But today we're going to give you a little background on the beginning. Well, maybe it's not such a little background. We're going to give you a lot of background on where did the gift of prayer really come from? And what was God's aim and purpose in giving us that gift? Because the origins of prayer actually show and demonstrate the heart of God at work. And we remember what we learned in Genesis chapter 3. There was the fall into sin. And sometimes when you take a fall, all you do is skin your nose a little bit. And other times you can break many bones, depending on how far you fall and what kind of injuries you suffer when you fall. And the world, unfortunately, oftentimes does not take the fall into sin as a serious consequence. Sometimes people kind of make fun of, oh, well, no big deal. Everybody does it. Well, that's true. But it also says everybody dies. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it is, isn't it? And in chapter 3 of Genesis, we find three gospel promises in the midst of God pronouncing the curse upon sin and Satan and death. And those three gospel promises are found, number one, in what we call the first gospel promise, and that is in Genesis 3.15, where God is pronouncing the curse upon Satan and to say that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. How do you kill a snake? You crush its head, you cut its head off. But that seed of the woman is also going to have its heel crushed. And having one who had to have heel surgery in the past, I can tell you when your heel hurts, y'all hurt all over. <laughs> but it would not be a fatal blow because when it happened to Jesus, he rose from death to life. That was promise number one. What was promise number two? Well, when Adam and Eve became aware that they had sinned against God, they became scared of God. And when they heard the sound of God walking in the garden, apparently it had been a pattern of God to come and visit them and walk and talk with them in the garden. We don't know exactly how they saw him because he's a spirit and they're not. But it says they know they heard the sound of God walking in the garden. And what did they do? They hid because they realized after they sinned that they were naked and they were ashamed. And in their great brilliance of solving the problem, they gathered some fig leaves. I hope to God their fig trees had bigger leaves than the fig trees I've seen. Yeah, but it says what? You and I know what happens with fig leaves when they're picked off of a tree. They soon dry out. And your fig suit will break if you sit down. So it's not a very good solution. And here comes grace number two. God, who was the author of life, the creator of life, actually killed the first of his creatures to make for his children who could only create fig leaves suits, suits from animal skins, which lasted much longer. Another act of God's grace for them. And the third act comes in the one where I have to confess that back in my little home country church, I was taught false doctrine. 
because I had a Sunday school teacher who told me, do you know why you were put out of the Garden of Eden? Because you had sinned. It was punishment. You were being cast out. But you know, I've discovered that's not what God said. What does God do? If we go back where it tells about God planting in the trees in the garden in chapter 2, he says, And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Oh, and then he mentions a couple of special trees. The tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what God did not want to have happen is he did not want to have us eat of the second tree, the tree of life. Because then we would have been forever trapped in that damaged condition. There could not have been restoration. There could not have been healing. There could not have been people who were made new. But now, God, because he protected us, it says that the reason that God kept us away was, behold, that if we would get there, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So it was God's grace that he barred us from the tree of life because God knew how the book called the Bible was going to end because the tree of life is not barred to us when we get to heaven. The last book of the Bible, the tree of life occurs, only it's a little different this time. How many trees of life are there? You don't know? There are two, not one. You see, in that heavenly Jerusalem, that new Jerusalem, there is the river of life streaming down the center of the city of Jerusalem. And we're told that on each side of the river, there is a tree of life. Nobody has to forge a raging stream to get across, to get to the tree of life. It's free and available to us all on either side of the river because thou, God, wants to give us life back in its fullness. That's what we look forward to when we are brought into the Father's house. Thank God that we were barred from the tree of life until God could get the whole restoration plan taken care of. Because that sin problem is not a minor difficulty it is a serious problem. The first thing it did, we're told, was it broke our relationship with God. All of a sudden, man, instead of looking forward to talking with God, communing with God, hid from God. And not only was this relationship with God fractured, we're told that it was, what also was fractured was the first human social relationship that God had established, marriage and the family. That too was broken. Because now when God addressed Adam and Eve about their fall into sin, they began to play the first chapter of the blame game. Oh, that's a popular game, isn't it? Republicans say, it's the Democrats' fault. Democrats say, it's the Republicans' fault. Husband says, the wife's fault. She says, my fault. No. Maybe she does if she confesses. But see, we all have fault, and we play the blame game. And you'll notice what happened. Adam even had the audacity to blame God. He says, well, the woman, the one you gave me, she gave me the fruit, and I ate. So whose fault is it? Is it mine, or is it yours, God, for giving me that woman? The blame game. We fracture life and relationships. And we see how serious that becomes, particularly as it destroys the family, as brother rises up against brother and kills his own brother. We say blood is thicker than water. You know, families stick together. Now, Cain and Abel didn't stick together. And I know too many sad stories of other families who have not stuck together. Cain slays Abel because he recognized that God 
gave more favor to Abel for his sacrifice than he did to his. But God immediately confronts Cain and says, now wait a minute, if you did the right thing, you would have been accepted. Cain, the problem isn't with your offering, the problem is with you and your relationship with me. That's the problem. So that's why sin is such a dangerous thing. But you know what happens even in the midst of that terrible tragedy, brother slaying brother? God's grace appears. Because when God confronts Cain, he says to him, I can't bear this. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And then we hear about the mark of Cain. And I've heard that misrepresented too. We're told, ha ha, the mark of Cain. God was saying, there's the murderer, watch out for him. There's the murderer, watch out for him. No, that's not what God says. What does God say? God said, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. See, the mark of Cain is a sign of grace from God. And isn't that grace amazing? Every time the devil tries to break us apart from our God, from one another, he comes with his forgiving grace, with his healing help to change things. That's why I believe one of the most important sayings that we need to remember as we pray is even when we are faithless, God is always faithful. He can't count on us, but we can sure count on him. And every time we saw in this story thus far that sin broke our relationship, God intervenes with his grace to restore, to renew the correction, the connection. Prayer is God's plan to keep us connected to God, to one another. And that's what we need to remember as we think about praying. Because when we pray, we're not just to pray for ourselves. What's the missing word in the Lord's Prayer? My, me. No, it's our Father. Everything is about us and all people. That's the heart of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son for us. And we have to keep that in the center of our prayer life. We are to pray to him, acknowledging he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. We are to pray for one another. Yes, you pray for yourself, but you never stop with prayer just for self. You are to pray for others. You are to pray, Jesus says, for your enemies. You are to pray for the entire world because God is standing there before the world with his arms stretched out saying, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He is ready to enfold us and he speaks to the unbeliever and the believer, inviting us to return to him. Now we're at the root of prayer. You cannot understand prayer unless you understand the grace and mercy of God. You notice how the grace and mercy of God always pops up at those moments to say, come to me. And now we hear in Genesis chapter 4, you heard that read in the Old Testament lesson, verses 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son, called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. That marks God's restoration of his conversations with us. 
That marks the beginning of prayer after the fall into sin. Once again, we began to recognize our need to communicate with God. And if you do not see the grace of God in your own life, you will not practice the grace of God in your prayer life. You see, prayer is a gift of grace. Ask yourself a simple question. What right do I, a sinful human being, have to pester the Lord of Lords and King of Kings 24-7, any time we want to? Have you done anything to deserve that? Have you done anything to earn the right to do that? No. It is a gracious gift of the Heavenly Father who created you and who forgave you and who loves you and says, come to me. That's our joy. That's our privilege. That's our gift. That's why I believe it's correct to say, yes, we recognize God hates sin, but God loves his children. That we must never forget. And then we came to those strange words on the mountain of transfiguration. Now you remember on this journey of Jesus that we find in both Gospels, in all the Gospels, as they've journeyed from northern Israel down to Jerusalem for that one final time to observe the Passover. That Jesus knows this time it's not going to just be a visit. It's going to be a death, the cruel death of crucifixion, the cruel death of the cross. He is going there to do that for us, to destroy the sacrificial system. Otherwise, year after year, day after day, time after time, what had to happen? Another one of those little lambs raised in the Bethlehem fields out there by the shepherd priests of the temple was killed. But the blood of the animals could not take away the sin of the world. But this time Jesus was going to be the true Lamb of God, the innocent one for the guilty one. And that's why, because the, the Lord knew this was going to be a very difficult time, he wanted the disciples to be prepared and all of those who loved Jesus for what lay ahead for them. The problem was that even those who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one of God, they only believed that because they were looking for someone to kick the tail of the Romans. That was their fervent desire. But God says, there's bigger tail out there. Sin, death, Satan. And God was coming to conquer them. Jesus, who became our brother. He always was the Son of God, part of the Holy Trinity. But remember at Bethlehem, or really at conception, he began to be one of us. He took on human flesh so that he could be the perfect substitute for you. You know, when people need to have organs transplanted, they have to watch carefully to match the donor with the receiver. And this was God matching the donor. Jesus, who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin who became the sacrifice, the perfect payment. He fulfilled the law of God for us. He suffered the punishment of the sin of death for us, for the wage of sin is death. And that's why on this Mount of Transfiguration, God came to speak to the disciples and for them to see and to share in the days to come. Don't forget who he is. God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And in fact, when God called a human, you know, there were no human heroes in the story of the Exodus. 
Sometimes we hear in history where someone of the tribe or someone of the group rises up and leads the rebellion and leads the people on to freedom. There were none of the slaves in Egypt who rose up to find freedom. But the God who knew all the things that were going to happen, the God who knew everything that would be, knew that the life of Moses was divided into three 40-year periods. The first 40 year for a year, the first 40 years, he was set to be killed. All the boy babies were commanded by the Pharaoh to be drowned in the Nile. The midwives didn't all go along with that. They protected, and Moses' mother put him in a wicker basket, hid him in the reeds along the shore of the Nile, and guess who found him? The daughter of the Pharaoh heard the baby cry. And they rescued him. And where did he go? He was not buried in the waters of the Nile. He went to live at the home of the Pharaoh. <laughs> this little Jewish boy got invited into the palace. And for 40 years, he received training and education and many things that he would have never received as a slave boy. But one day, because he knew his roots, his mother had been his wet nurse. He knew who he was and from where he was. He saw an Egyptian beating up one of the people of Israel. And he rose up and he slew him. And he thought first he'd gotten away with it, but the next day he realized that it was known. And so he fled and he began the second 40-year pilgrimage. He became a sheep herder in the wilderness of Midian, found a wife, grew a family, and became familiar with living in the desert because God had another 40-year plan. It was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness because of their disobedience to God on the journey. I had a little hope when I got to 80. I said, gosh, maybe God has something in store for my next 40 years. He did, but none of it was what I planned. <laughs> but God is still in it. God is still a part of it. God is still doing it. That's what I count on. That's what Marge count on. And when God called Moses, Moses was a wimp. He tried to get out of it. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. And this is what God said. Say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. And that's how they found freedom. Not because of anything they did, but because of God's care for them as he brought the ten plagues. And finally, only the last seven of them on Egyptians alone. And finally, the tenth plague, where they fled with the wealth of Egypt as God had promised without ever raising any armaments against them. God was at work in the Exodus. There are a few lessons of the Exodus, and that's why it's important to understand that in the Mount of Transfiguration story, why what you have is you have the story not of their departure, as it's translated in most cases. The word actually there is Exodus. In Jesus' Exodus to Jerusalem, he was going to the cross to open up our exodus to the Father's house, to our promised land. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Have I not made it so? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And it happens not because of anything you do. It happens because of what God has done. And that's why your prayer life will never be full. It will never be rich. It will never be the prayer that God intends unless you understand how the grace of God is at work in every situation. People sometimes complain about some books of the Bible. One of the books of the Bible they complain about is the book of Revelation. Wait a minute, isn't that the book where there's two trees of life? That sounds like good news, doesn't it? If you want the summary of the book of Revelation, it is simply this. Jesus always wins. That's our confidence. The other thing the Exodus taught us was about Trusting God is something we need to do day by day by day. He taught the children of Israel that in the wilderness by the manna. Because there was only six days a week they could collect the manna. Saturday and Sunday, or not Saturday and Sunday, that would be our way of doing it. But for the Jewish way, it was Friday and Saturday. Because the Sabbath is a Saturday for them. And they would collect for two days. And it would work. But if they tried that on Monday, ah, oh, I won't have to get up so early if I go and collect extra today. But no, God says, you do, it's going to rot and stink something terrible. Trust God day by day. Don't tell me what you're going to do next year. Don't tell me what you're going to do next month. Just, I lay my life in your hands this day. And tomorrow, I'll do it again. And you see, that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. The, the best translation, really, of that fourth petition is, give us our bread day by day. Trust him from one day to the next. Don't look down the road. And what that evokes out of us is not a servitude where we are under threat and under command. But it reflects a response of love because we have been loved by God. You know what the word amen really means? It shall be so. That's our confidence. So when you pray in faith, day by day, continuing to trust, it shall be be so. Jesus always wins. Hallelujah. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ and with Christ unto life everlasting. And now let us go to prayer, where Jesus always wins. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me, as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God our Father in heaven, look with, us, with, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word, and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. We pray bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith that the number of believers may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. And on this day, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, according to your will, both in life and in death. 
in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Lord, on this day, into your merciful hands, we commend the Buffalo family at the death of Dolores. We also commend to you the Cahaya family at the death of David. Lord, we ask that you would continue to wrap your arms of love and grace and mercy around both of these families as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. Continue to bless and keep them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. We also pray this day, Lord, for Brandon as he awaits transplants and as he uh, is awaiting transportation to Miami. Lord, we pray that you would place your hands of healing on him through any way possible, doctors, nurses, and of course, the healing of miracles. Lord, be with his family as they await with him. Continue to lift them up. Continue to give them the strength as they continue to be by his bedside. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we also hold up to you Marlene, who is home, Harold, who is, continues to be hospitalized, and Dorothy Matthews, and all who are in need, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done, Lord, in your mercy. And we do pray, Lord, that you would grant us daily, day by day, our bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we continue to pray for all these things that you have given to us, and we thank you especially for the blessing and the gift of grace through prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to please stand, if you are able, and receive God's holy benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen.
peace and serve the Lord.